Welcome back to Davenant Academy and to our class, Introduction to the Reformation. I'm Dr. Brad Littlejohn, and today we're going to be talking about the lost opportunity of Italian reform. Now, most of you probably don't associate Italy with the Reformation. Italy, to this day, is an almost entirely Catholic country. Italy is, of course, the seat of the papacy. It is the heart of the Roman Catholic Church. And so you might suppose that wherever the Reformation might have been taken root, it certainly had no presence whatsoever in Italy. And indeed, that is how things end up. The Reformation does not ultimately succeed in Italy on any level. However, there was a period in the early 15, well, basically from the 1520s till the 1540s, when it looked very much like the Reformation might succeed not only in places like northern, northern Germany, Scandinavia, but in the heart of the Catholic Church in Italy, and perhaps even in Rome. So that's the story we're going to be looking at today. Now this story primarily revolves around a remarkable man who is way too little known today, Peter Martyr Vermigli. Now Peter Martyr, you might imagine from his name, was a martyr. In fact, he lived to an old age. He lived to the age of 63, older than many of the reformers. His years were 1499 to 1562. He was in fact named Peter Martyr at birth, being named after an Italian saint and martyr. And Vermigli is his last name. So Peter, Peter, Peter Martyr, Martyr is his middle name, right, basically. Now, he is born in the city of Florence, Italy which is, of course, a famous focal point of the Renaissance. Now, and this was the period, really kind of at the peak of the Renaissance. Um, Michelangelo was sculpting his David in Florence during these early years of Vermigli's life. And uh, Lorenzo the Magnificent of the Medici family was, uh, was ruling. But, well, or actually, he, uh, the period just before um, Vermigli was born. Florence had been wrought by a sort of pre-Reformation by a famous radical monk named Girolamo Savonarola. So Savonarola was a, a kind of uh, visionary mystic, a monk who uh, was, was passionately concerned about the corruption of the late medieval church, as many were, but uh, Savonarola especially so. And he, sought, he set to work to uh, bring reform in the city of uh, Florence. And he was so influential through his preaching and so passionate and so uh, sincere in his conviction that he, he gained tremendous influence. And there was a period in which he basically controlled the city of Florence and had a kind of uh, sort of utopian vision for society before he was ultimately uh, overpowered and executed as a heretic. Uh, in fact, burned at the stake, of course, as a heretic, as was usually the case. So John Calvin's successor, Theodore Beza, was later to write that out of the ashes of Savonarola, Peter Martyr Vermigli rose like a phoenix. So, uh, Vermigli is born in 1499, just the year after Savonarola had been executed. So this sort of reformational fervor is in the air in Florence in Vermigli's youth. Now, Vermigli was uh, displayed a precocious intelligence and fervent piety from an early age. And he joined the Augustinian order of monks at the age of 15 and was sent to study for four, four years later in 1518 at the University of Padua, one of the oldest and most highly regarded of the universities of, of Europe. And this is, Padua is in, in Northern Italy, not, not far from, um, from Venice and Florence. And this was perhaps at that time, perhaps the greatest intellectual center in Europe at this, at this time. So he spent the next eight years studying at Padua absorbed in his books, heedless of the chaos, a few hundred miles to the north, where a fellow Augustinian monk, Martin Luther, 
had begun and nailed some theses to a church in Germany and started an uproar. Now, during this period, there was scarcely any area of learning that Vermigli did not master. In Padua, he had access to the great tradition of medieval scholastic theology and immersed himself in that. But he also shared the humanist passion of the Italian Renaissance, the thirst to return to the sources and read them in the original languages. So Vermigli dedicated himself not merely to mastering the works of Aristotle in the original Greek. Um, he also read Cicero and the Platonists and the Church Fathers. And he, in fact, uh, found a Jewish rabbi to teach him Hebrew, which is a very rare knowledge at that time, although it was becoming more common, especially from the leaders of Reformation, to study Hebrew. He also studied with the law faculty at Padua. As, and a passion for, for, for legal theory was something that he would bring with him into his reforming career that would be important later on during his time in the Church of England. Now, uh, and in fact, this is, you might surprise you, for Migli, this Italian character, his most important and enduring contribution is going to be to the Church in England. We're not actually going to talk about that just much in this lesson because it, it gets, we're going to have to come back to the Church of England later on and for Migli's role there. Uh, but it's important to note, uh, that's one reason I, I talked about in the last uh, two lessons ago, of course, the English Reformation should be a particular concern to us as English speakers. And Peter Martyr Vermigli is one of the, um, the leading theologians of the who laid foundations for the Church of England. Now, Vermigli's first connection with England begins here in the later 1520s, when he struck up a friendship with a young English aristocrat named Reginald Pohl. Reginald Pohl, who was later, in fact, to become his reluctant nemesis. Now, Pohl was a member of the English royal family and had, in fact, been a favorite of King Henry VIII, who had paid for his education and sent him to Italy. Pohl was a devout humanist. He was committed to the cause of church reform but as time went on, he became increasingly opposed to the way that the Reformation took shape in England. He was particularly incensed at Henry's divorce and the various measures that Henry took to, uh, to break with the Pope in England. So um, when Henry begins the divorce and the break with the papacy, Paul ultimately decides to stay in Italy and to break his ties with Henry to continue supporting the Pope. However, Paul had not given up on the idea of reform. He just wanted to pursue reform in a more patient, from the inside out way. Whereas he saw people like Henry as uh, rash, violent, disrupting the peace of the church and, and making sustainable reform more difficult. Now here in the early 1530s, Vermigli, is not yet a reader of the reformers themselves. He probably hasn't actually, uh, he's aware of course of Luther, but he, of course, he's heard all this, all this stuff about what a dangerous heretic he is. So he's not actually reading the writings of Luther or, or Zwingli or any of these reformers in Northern Europe. But he'd already come to many of the same conclusions by his own reading of the scriptures and the church fathers, and especially the greatest of the church fathers, St. Augustine, who was, in, who was revered by all the Protestant reformers as one of their leading theological inspirations. So Vermigli, like Luther, was in the Augustinian order of monks, and so he's particularly attuned to the theology of Augustine. And by reading Augustine and studying the scriptures in the original, uh, Vermigli and a circle of friends around him known as the Spirituali had arrived at something very similar to Luther's teaching of justification by faith. Uh, and with, around Vermigli is this circle of reform-minded leaders. We've already talked about Paul. Others were Jacopo Satelletto, who we mentioned uh, in the last lesson as the one who wrote to Geneva, exhorting them to return to the Catholic Church in 1540. So Satelletto is a, is, is, Concern for church reform, but ultimately loyal to the Pope, and he remains loyal to the Pope throughout his life, and he becomes uh, an opponent of, of John Calvin. Another who ultimately 
veers furthest in the path of, of at least Protestant reform is Giovanni Carafa, Cardinal Carafa, who from 1541 onwards is actually going to become, or 1542 onward, is going to become the leader of the Roman Inquisition dedicated to stamping out any hints of Protestantism in Italy. So he very much, uh, although he's interested in reform in a certain sense, he ultimately has no sympathy for the Protestant Reformation. However, another figure who is more sympathetic was a friend of Vermigli, Gasparo Contarini. Now, it, in, in 1541, in fact, one of the more remarkable episodes of the Reformation happens. There is a colloquy, it's called the Colloquy of Regensburg or Ratisbon. And it's an attempt by the Protestant leaders and Catholic leaders like Contarini, who have been at the center of the reform movement in Italy, but are, remain loyal to the Pope. It's an attempt to come to some kind of agreement around the, uh, the fundamental issues that had divided the church in the Reformation, and particularly, of course, the doctrine of justification. So this was a moment at which it appeared, more than 20 years after Luther had been excommunicated, as if some kind of reconciliation might still be possible, some kind of understanding might be reached between the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestants. And uh, Contarini goes to Regensburg to meet with uh, Philip Melanchthon and other Protestant leaders, and they spent quite a bit of time trying to hammer out an agreement. And particularly, they came to a statement on the doctrine of justification they thought they both could agree upon. Although, in the end, neither Luther, uh, Luther rejected it, and Contarini's uh, Roman superiors rejected it. So the, the the negotiators came to an agreement that they said, oh, Protestants and Catholics can agree on this, but then their colleagues uh, rejected it and it ultimately came to nothing. Now, in Italy, if, you know, in Germany, there was a little bit of a disagreement between Luther and Melanchthon, but it didn't turn into anything serious. Contarini, on the other hand, is seen as having gone much too far in making peace with the Protestants. So when he comes back to Rome after the colloquy of Regensburg, there is a backlash. And Carafa, as I said, is put in charge of the Roman Inquisition, which is um, assigned to begin uh, smoking out Protestant sympathizers and ultimately forcing them to recant or burning them at the stake. So things start to get rather tense for Vermigli. However, he is able to uh, still fly under the radar. He he's, he's transferred to a new position at the city of Lucca in Northern Italy. And there he is joined by several younger colleagues who are disciples of his and who are also um, basically closet Protestants, as Vermigli is indeed by this time. Vermigli would really consider himself to be a Protestant, but he keeps that under the radar. With him is this fellow here. Um, this is Girolamo Zenchi, who is uh, another great Italian theologian a brilliant intellect, a great scholar of, of scripture and of um, medieval theology. And Zanke is, in fact, he's gonna live, uh, I'm trying to remember his years, he lives to a, quite an old age. Uh, so he's very active um, well throughout the 16th century and becomes a very important Protestant theologian in, uh, in Germany and, and Switzerland. Another, disciple of Vermiglis, who was going to have a major impact, is this fellow, Bernardino Ochino. Now, uh, his was a little less fortunate because Ochino ultimately um, began to toy with uh, anti-Trinitarianism. There were radical groups in the Reformation that began to reject not merely Roman Catholic teachings that uh, have always been uh, rejected by Protestants, but began to reject tra traditional classic Christian teachings like the doctrine of the Trinity. And Okino, at the very least, was accused of having to toyed with these beliefs. He seemed to be uh, friendly to the anti-Trinitarians. And so he ultimately was banished from, I believe it was Zurich, where he was teaching at that time, you know, a, few, a couple decades later. And uh, 
is, is no longer treated as a reliable theologian at all. However, another of Vermigli's disciples, Emmanuel Tremelius, does continue to remain a, a faithful Protestant throughout his life. And uh, he is particularly known as a great Hebrew scholar. And in fact, uh, he is responsible for one of the um, uh, most important uh, translations of the Bible in the 16th century. He assists with it, which is an attempt to replace the Latin Vulgate with a better Latin translation of scripture. Of course, they're translating scripture into the original, or not into the, into the vernacular languages. There's, there's German Bibles, there's French Bibles, there's English Bibles. But the Protestants, Latin is the language that they speak, the scholars speak between one another, and that they read, they write all their treatises in it. So a good Latin Bible is important too. And they thought the Vulgate could be improved upon. So Tremelius is responsible for translating the Old Testament into a new Protestant Latin Bible. So in the early 1530s, Vermigli finds himself in the heart of Italy, at the center of a circle of friends, all of whom are in positions of considerable influence and all of whom uh, share in some way a enthusiasm for the idea of reforming the Catholic Church. But they have very different ideas of what this reform might mean. The first of these figures is Jacopo Satelletto, who becomes a cardinal later in the 1530s, one of the, which is of course one of the, the, high, the highest ranks you can receive in the Catholic Church. And uh, he, we've already encountered him last week as the guy who writes a letter to the city of Geneva early in the 1540s, exhorting them to return to the Roman Catholic Church. And John Calvin writes his famous reply to Satelletto. So Sadaletto never becomes a Protestant. Nonetheless, Sadaletto was a moderate. He was sympathetic to many of the concerns of the Protestants. So this is part of the reason why his letter to the Geneva was uh, more persuasive than someone who had just who was just an arch enemy of Protestantism. So, uh, Sadaletto never becomes a Protestant, but he is an advocate for a moderate, reformed form, a more somewhat reformed form of Roman Catholicism until his death. The next figure, Giovanni Carafa, becomes a cardinal around the same time and ends up, uh, ends his life as Pope Paul IV. Now, Carafa also is concerned with reform, but he has a very different idea of what reform looks like. Uh, the word reform could mean could mean cracking down on abuses within the Catholic Church. There were certainly abuses. There were clergy that didn't take the responsibilities seriously, that lived in immorality, that uh, pursued wealth rather than piety. And this was part of what had provoked the Reformation to begin with. And one could oppose these kinds of corruptions without in any way wanting to get rid of the, the, the current structure of the Catholic Church without uh, without getting rid of the authority of popes and bishops, without embracing the Protestant doctrine of justification by faith. So Carafa wants to see the church reformed, but so that the church can become, can, can effectively wield its spiritual power. So Carafa will actually become the leader um, of the Roman Inquisition in 1542. He will head up the attempt to hunt down and stamp out Protestants uh, throughout Italy. And he, perhaps more than anyone else, is responsible for the fact that the Italian Reformation never really takes root. Now, the Roman Inquisition is a response to, more than anything, the work of yet another cardinal, yet another of Vermigli's circle. This guy, Gasparo Contarini. Now, Contarini, perhaps more than anyone else within the Roman Catholic Church of this period was deeply sympathetic to the Protestants. He, with Vermigli, had been a student of the writings of Augustine and had arrived at something very close to the Protestant understanding of justification by faith. And so it is that in 1541, the moment at which the Catholic Church is the most willing to attempt a, some kind of conversation and reconciliation with the Protestants, that Contarini is chosen as the ambassador to go and represent 
the Roman Catholic Church at a colloquy, a conference in Regensburg, sometimes called the Gratisbon, but colloquy of Regensburg in Southern Germany in 1541. So Kant, Rini, and other representatives of the Pope go, and, and on the other side, uh, Philip Melanchthon and several other Protestant leaders come. And they meet together at Regensburg uh, for several weeks, just trying to hammer out some kind of joint statement of doctrine that will acknowledge the key points that the Protestants have been fighting for, but not give too much ground. So um, they actually did come to agreement on many points about abuses in the church that need to be reformed, about, about freedom that needed to be given to believers, and um, about even the doctrine of justification. That was the key one in which they expended most of their attention. And since Contarini was more sympathetic to the Protestant doctrine to begin with, it's perhaps not so surprising that he and Melanchthon were able to come to an agreement. Unfortunately, the statement that they agreed upon for a moment may have looked like the Reformation had, had ended or had fulfilled its purpose, that, that there was going to be a real reform that, that went uh, to the heart of the Catholic Church. But the statement that was agreed upon is rejected by Luther. Luther thought that it gave way too much. And more importantly, it was rejected by the Pope. Contarini was seen as having uh, too much betrayed the cause of the Roman Catholic Church to the Protestants. And so uh, Contarini is somewhat is disgraced, loses influence. Carafa comes to the fore instead, leads the Roman Inquisition and begins working on stamping out Protestantism. So it is at this point that Vermigli in 1542 is going to find that Italy is getting a bit too hot for him. He's, he's not gonna be able to continue his closet Protestantism any longer. However, before we follow Vermigli on his exile to Northern Europe, let me mention a few other figures, a new circle of friends that Vermigli has established. At this time, he is teaching at uh, at a monastery in Lucca, Northern Italy. And he has several star students, uh, many of whom are going to become leaders of the Reformation thereafter. I will mention three of them. The first that you see here is Girolamo Zanchi, probably Vermigli's most famous student, though you probably haven't heard of him. Ver Zanchi uh, actually stays in Italy until 1552. He managed to sort of fly under the radar and avoid the Inquisition for quite a while. 1552, he finally comes north and he begins an illustrious career teaching at uh, the University of Heidelberg and other places in Germany. And uh, Zanke is considered one of the leading theologians of the Reformed tradition during this period. Uh, he he's, has an intense philosophical intellect that is able to synthesize uh, Protestant teaching with the, the best of medieval scholastic teaching. So um, Zanke is one of um, Peter Marta Vermigli's most important contributions to the Reformation, his student Zanke. Another was his student uh, Bernardo Ochino. Unfortunately, Ochino does not have quite as happy of a legacy. Ochino is going to follow uh, Vermigli north ultimately to England. We'll be talking about that in a future lesson, how they end up in England. But uh, he, he, he spends a time as a professor at Cambridge, I believe it is, Cambridge or Oxford, before he has to leave England due to the rise of, of, of Bloody Mary. Again, we'll talk about that in a future episode. Okino ends his life, well, he, doesn't, he ends up in Zurich, as many reformers did uh, during that period. And ultimately, Bocchino is seen as flirting with the heresy of anti-Trinitarianism, along with the sort of more radical Reformation movements. There arose a new dabbling with the idea, in some cases explicitly embracing the idea, that the Trinity was one of the corruptions of the Catholic Church that needed to be gotten rid of. Okino was seen as having given too much ground to this, and he ends up being exiled from Dur Zurich and dies somewhat in disgrace although he had had a promising career as a Protestant leader before that. A third student of Vermigli's during this time is Emmanuel Tremelius, very interesting figure, who was actually born Jewish. He converted to Christianity in 1540 under the influence of Reginald Pohl, uh, 
we talked about earlier. And shortly afterward, comes in contact with Vermili and becomes a Protestant. So he is one of Vermili's circle of closet Protestants at Lucca. He also will follow Vermili North. He also will end up teaching in, in England at the University of Cambridge. And uh, then we'll end up back at Heidelberg, where, where Zanke is also later in the 16th century. And Tremelius is, a, as you can imagine, having grown up Jewish, he's a great Hebrew scholar. He's one of the great, becomes one of the greatest Hebrew scholars among the reformed. And he, uh, in fact, is involved in a key project to do a new Latin translation of the Bible that will replace the Catholic Vulgate. And so Tremelius' translation of the Old Testament from Hebrew to Latin becomes one of the key, uh, key Bibles, part of one of the key Bibles of the 16th century. So uh, Vermeili is important, is going to be important not merely for his own teaching influence, uh, but for uh, the, the influence of these other men that he, had inf that, he, that he had influenced during his time in Italy. So let's just talk briefly about the latter stages of Vermeili's career, or the middle stages rather. We'll touch on the latter stages later. So he leaves uh, Lucca in 1542, he flees north to Zurich. He shows up in Zurich, Switzerland, and professes himself to be a Protestant. This is a kind of a weird moment. If you can imagine, if you're Heinrich Bullinger, who's now the leader of the Church of Zurich, he has taken over from Ulrich Zwingli 11 years earlier. So Bullinger encounters this Italian monk, he's a very high-ranking Italian theologian who has uh, been at the heart of the Roman Catholic Church in Italy for the last 20 years, and this guy tells him, trust me, I'm one of your guys. I'm not a spy. Trust me, I'm not here from the Pope. I am a Protestant too. So Bullinger interviews Vermigli and is convinced that he is indeed, uh, he is indeed a, a, a Protestant, and he is an incredible gift to the Protestant cause. There, Protestants have very few men of Vermigli's training and intellect uh, and knowledge of, 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 of Hebrew and Greek, of the church fathers, and of medieval theology. Vermigli is, um, immediately begins to make a contribution as one of the leading Protestant intellects. So Bullinger sends him on to his friend Bootser at Strasbourg, and uh, Vermigli begins teaching there with Bootser from 1542 to 1547. Actually, Vermigli shows up in Strasbourg almost right after Calvin leaves Strasbourg. You remember Calvin goes to Strasbourg when he leaves Geneva, spends a few years there, and then is called back to Geneva in 1542. Almost immediately thereafter, Vermigli comes and replaces him as Bootser's right-hand man in Strasbourg. So uh, Vermigli is going to begin lecturing there and writing commentaries on uh, different books of the Bible, and these commentaries are going to become very important texts that are formative for the uh, the development of Protestant theology. However, both Vermigli and Bootser are going to have to clear out of Strasbourg in a hurry in the year 1547, when some events take place that put the entire Reformation in danger. In these events, we're going to talk about on next week's lesson, the Empire Strikes Back. So please join us next time on Davenant Academy. Thank you. Thank you.